Former Florida standout wide receiver, professional football player. He's on Sirius XM. What else? He's on the SEC Network what and else? ESPN. And he beat Derek Zoolander in the 2007 Male Model of the Year Boom. Award. Our guy, Chris Doring. CD, what's up, buddy? <laughs> Very kind, man. Good to be back with you boys, man. I miss y'all. Dude, for sure. I miss our talks. Like I said, it's like I was texting the other day. I I miss our talks. We're getting closer to kickoff, obviously. And look, CD, uh, I know it's it's a brand new era of college football. You look at the 12-team playoff. You obviously look at the conference realignment. But I want to start at a place that hits close to home for you in Gainesville. And I was talking about earlier with Billy Napier. And look, at a place like Florida, eventually you got to win. I can like you as a person. You can be a good guy. You can donate to charity. You can help old ladies cross the street. But you can't be six and seven and five and seven and people feeling great going into year three but you look at this schedule man and then you look at it again for 2025 when you look at florida how what does billy have to do this year to make it to 2025 because i think it's a legitimate thing to say that he's on the hot seat and he should be at a place like florida yeah i mean i obviously losing seasons are not the norm here in gainesville you know when i was at florida never could have imagined not being bowl eligible. So it's, it's been frustrating the, uh, the inevitable decline of the program. Um, you know, Florida has everything you need to, to, to win championships, mm-hmm. a, a fertile recruiting ground within the state. Uh, facilities have been upgraded. Uh, you got passionate fan base, the flagship university of the state of Florida. So there's really no excuse not to win. Um, I understand that, that Coach Napier inherited kind of a tough spot. The roster yeah. talent was way down. I think he's done a nice job of, of changing the culture and also upgrading the talent. But uh, you do have to start to have some wins. And, and you mentioned the schedule. I thought it was interesting, Jake. I, 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 I called the, the Florida spring game for the SEC Network. I spent you know, Tuesday and Thursday with them at practice. I sat down with the coaches and, and Graham Mertz on Friday. Yeah, these guys are kind of embracing the challenge of the schedule. And, and yeah. Billy Napier may have told you this, but he, he mentioned to me, like, the schedule's really not that much different than last year. And if you, you look at it, there's some some nice caveats about how it might be more advantageous in some ways. Instead of going yeah. to Utah, a top-10 U team in week one, you get mm-hmm. a chance to play Miami at home. You don't have to go to Lexington to play Kentucky. You get the Wildcats in the swamp. You don't have to go to Baton Rouge to play an LSU team with a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback and two first-round receivers. You get those guys coming to Gainesville without all that talent. You don't have to play a Jordan Travis-led Florida State team up in Tallahassee. So, you know, I I don't really know if it's about wins and losses to me as much as it is about how they aesthetically look. Can they look more organized? Can they execute better? Do they they look like they have a, a, a better plan? Can they be more consistent? Those are the things that I think I'm looking for. I know there's a lot of fans that want to put a number on on wins mm-hmm. that you have to have, but I think you can gauge success without necessarily having to quantify it with a number of wins and losses. Yeah, and and CD, I, I said all I, I, after last year, and I used the the fourth and four at Utah with having two guys with the same jersey number out there on yeah. punt return, which can't happen. Sometimes it's not if just if you lose, it's how you lose, and it did at times look disorganized, right, procedurally, penalties and and stuff like that. But you bring up an interesting point. You know, if you do embrace that, and let's say you're having success during the season, we're going to start hearing the term bubble a lot for the playoff. And in college basketball all the time, what do those teams on the bubble need at the end? They need big-time games to be able to make it in. So if your schedule is a little bit back heavy, or maybe you're having to play like a UCF or somebody late or a Florida State late, and you're trying to get in that playoff, at the end of the day, it could actually, that win could boost you at the end as opposed to it being like, you know, all doom and gloom. No question about it. I mean, it, it, and you guys know this, man. Like, as a competitor, I want to play a great schedule. I don't want to play right. against some directional school. I want to play against the best. Obviously, you get to do that within the league, but the uh, out-of-conference schedule is very ambitious. You have Miami, you got Florida State, you got UCF. That's the way it should be, man. When I was growing up yeah. in, in Gainesville, Florida played Miami every year. They played Florida State every year. There was mm-hmm. a real championship amongst the big three as it related to the, the state title. I, I, I wish that Florida would get back to doing that more. I understand the challenges that are presented with the schedule and the neutral site game <laughs> against Georgia. But this is a this is a year right now where – you get uh, seven home games. And I've heard a lot of the Florida players tell me about how that's an advantage for them. I believe it in theory. It was a, an advantage when I was there. 
But when you lose at home to Arkansas, you can't necessarily say that we have a home field advantage that we're going to win every game that we go out and play within the swamp. So they, they have to start making sure that they take advantage, that the fans have to create that advantage, but they have to they have to win ball games at home. And if you can you can win, you know, six or seven at home, I, I think this could be a year where Florida makes a, a big jump. Yeah. No doubt. Hey, Chris, prior to last month's NFL draft, I said my sneakiest pick for the draft was Florida wide receiver Ricky Pearsall. He was projected to go mid to late second round. I thought maybe a team slide up, get him in the top 10 of that second round. Forget that, man. The defending NFC champ San Francisco 49ers take Ricky Pearsall 31 overall, goes in the first round. What are your thoughts on that pick? Well, I'm very biased when you ask me this question for two reasons. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a big fan of Ricky Pearsall. I've gotten to know him the last couple of years. I'm also a, a good friend of Kyle Shanahan's. I played for his father in Denver for a couple of years. He and I are good friends and, and uh, just think the world of what he's been able to do throughout his coaching career. I think it's a perfect fit. You talk about a guy that, that understands how to put people in positions to be successful, how to utilize their unique skill sets. You know, look at look at what uh, Debo has been able to do there. Uh, look at what they they've done with with Brock Purdy. Like uh, this guy knows how to coach ball, and I think Ricky Pearsall is a perfect fit. He's a guy that that obviously uh, can go catch the football, but he's a willing blocker. He can carry the ball as well, so he's going to be another little versatile asset for Kyle to be able to take advantage of amongst a uh, a really talented offensive wa- uh, roster. So I, I can't wait to watch him acclimate to the NFL level. Yeah, I agree. Could have like a Puka Nakua. And he, yeah, and you know, he's not a little guy either. Like going down the no. senior bowl, like Lad McConkey's a smaller guy. You're getting those Wes Welker comparisons. I'm looking at Ricky Pearsall. We watched him down the senior bowl. I mean, he looks NFL ready from a route, you know, from an IQ standpoint, but from an option route standpoint, from understanding how to stem, getting in and out of breaks. He's a guy, Blaine, you liked a lot. Ricky's young, but he seems like a veteran guy. He does. He's got that I mean, old young. He moves around like a veteran guy. First, first of all, CD, what is up, dude? Hey, man. Good to hear from you, bro. I miss you. Been a minute, I know, dude. Hope you're still saying Jack and Tan just like your boy. I'm going to say in the SEC here, but I don't want to talk about a different team, all right? I don't talk about South Carolina. Ooh. One of the best stories in 2022, a rising story, saying they're going to be real players in the SEC, and we see the disaster of what it was last year in 2023. What do you think this year, Shane Beamer, the South Carolina, is he on the hot seat, and what's your expectations for the South Carolina football team this year? Yeah, man, it's a tough, kind of a tough, t- I, I don't know that we've ever known less about teams heading into spring than yeah. what we do now. Obviously, the transfer portal makes it very challenging. The The roster turnover is is difficult. But I, you know, shoot, I, I look at that quarterback uh, room that they have there. It definitely a little different style of quarterback that uh, than, than what Spencer Rattler had last year. Uh, I'm excited about what, what they're going to be able to do in terms of Im- uh, implementing more of the quarterback run yeah. into their offense. I just, you know, it, I look at Florida and South Carolina kind of in the same in the same category where they were forced to play a lot of young guys last year. They struggled because of it, but the the, the silver lining is that you do help some of the growing pains. It, it helps you be a better team next year. Mm-hmm. So all of those injuries forced a lot of young guys to have to play. I think that they could be a, a, a team that, that is a lot better. But again, you know, what does a lot better look like in terms of, of wins? It, it's a challenging league. Uh, and now you add Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, I just I, I think I think it, it'll be interesting, guys, as we expand to 12 teams and eventually 14 teams. Like, what does a successful season look like? What is, you know, how, how many teams actually believe they can win a national championship? Is it about having winning a se- winning season? Is it about getting into the the playoffs, which you would think would would take you know ten wins to do? I, I just uh, I, I think it'll be kind of fun to to see yeah. what the redefining of a successful season looks like. Well, it's it, it, real quick on South Carolina City. I think Lenoris has a chance to be a star. I'm just worried yeah. about the same thing I was worried about with South Carolina last year. It's up front. It's on that offensive line and defensive line. We all know sitting here talking, you can be the best quarterback skill player there is, but if I can't pass protect and I can't run the ball, you can't win a football game by yourself at this level. But when it comes to what a successful season is, I am following the college basketball path on this. Obviously, it depends on who you are. Some teams are just fine with making the NCAA tournament. Man, if we can just make the NCAA tournament, I don't care if we win in the first round, make it to the second round, whatever, and I'm talking about the playoff being the NCAA tournament, then you have teams that are like, man, if we don't make it to at least the Sweet 16 in the, in the 
NCAA tournament, it is a failure of a season. So I think we're going to see kind of that path with fan bases, and you're going to start hearing a lot of similar terms that we hear in college basketball as we get down to the stretch. So, so CD, real quick, uh, you think we're going to 14 in this playoff before it's said and done? Oh, there's no question about it. I think yeah. we go to 14 yeah. and eventually 16. Oh. I can't wait for this year. You know, I, I'm all about symmetry. I mean, 16 just seems too perfect. Uh, and, and I understand wanting to give the, the best team some advantages. But I, I, I would love to have those top four seeds having home games. I can't wait yes. to, to see how they, they handle the expansion. That may be my favorite part of what we're looking at this year is getting to watch those those uh, those those home games, the playoff games on site, what those potential home field advantages could look like at that Dude. time of year. I mean, it's going to be a lot of fun. Can you, if you'd have thought, like, if, if you go to, like, man, you know, like an Auburn, Alabama game, or you go to, like, Florida, Florida State, you're like, man, there's no way that this could get any crazier. And then you think about, like, Penn State hosting a whiteout game for the playoff. Can you imagine some of these environments? Dude, like, we're going to make alien contact. It's going to be so loud in some of these things. They're going to hear us <laughs> It'll be from Zeta Reticula peak, for Peak college football. Yeah, you want to talk yeah. about people needing to drink Z-biotics? Wait. You might as well put that stuff by the gallon of barrel full out there. But, uh, CD, man, first off, we appreciate yeah. you. I you know you're a busy guy. I know you're everywhere. Did I, I mean, Sirius XM. I know you're doing your thing with Hesty and PB and the boys. Uh, obviously, SEC Network, you guys got it covered like, like Augustus Gloop next to a chocolate factory. And then, obviously, you know, <laughs> You're, you're everywhere else, uh, basically. Is, did I miss anything? No, you, you hit it. You know, I still got the mortgage company, man. I'm actually uh, <laughs> this guy. to the airport. How about this for great timing? I, I got meetings in Miami this week, and then my birthday is Sunday, so I'm going to stay down. And six Atta days boy. in in, uh, in Miami may be aggressive. It kind of reminds me of what I did when we went to Media Days in Nashville. I turned that Media Day four-night trip into a seven-day trip, and that that had me on fumes. So uh, I'm pushing it again, but uh, I'll let you know how I'm doing next week. Hey, if you need any help, CD, I'm going to call away, dog. Yeah, listen, Lane, he can be down there in in two shakes of a a kitten's whiskers. And as we say on the show, it's like when you go down to to Miami, one ring to rule them all, and and in darkness darkness shall bind them. Appreciate it, CD. All right, boys. See y'all. Yeah. One of the best in the business. Chris Doring. We have some meetings in Miami, guys. Yeah, guys, I got a mortgage we meeting. We need to start Miami. having yeah, actions Miami, in Miami. Sweet. Oh, I got I got a meeting in uh, in uh, Turks and Caicos, too, except I'm just not going to bring anything Cheeks, eggs, and potatoes. That's exactly right. What's up, YouTube? Hey, do us a favor. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Keep sharing the show. We really appreciate it.